before I go on to, to talk about characters, let's talk about the times I, I, in which this is set. The Roman Empire is collapsing. Parts uh, uh, of Britain have already gone back under Celtic control. There's Germanic invasions into Britain. There's Scotty invasions into Britain from Ireland. And, and the Picta are, are coming down and raiding as well. And into this sort of mixture uh, of situations, I, I, I put my characters. So let's start out with perhaps the most important character first, and that's Arfnog. Arfnog's father was uh, a governor over an, an area of Britain that was a, a, against the Welsh border. Um, the western part of Britain had already declared independence, if you like, and, and uh, gone back to its sort of Celtic roots. The Celtic roots in Arfnog's area were strong, strong too. The area is attacked by uh, Germanic people un under a bit of manipulation uh, from, from other people too. And Arfnog ends up being brought up by the Celts. He's half Celtic, half Roman. He doesn't realise that he's half Celtic at first. So what are his motivations? Well, as a child, his motivations are surviving, I suppose. As he grows up, he becomes a warrior. He's trained as a warrior. He falls in love with the, with the country and with the Celtic people around him. And his motivations are to do the best for those people. And he uses the skills that he has, the skills as a warrior, as a, as a war leader. They try to make him into a king and it's, it's not really half nog. He's not him. It's not what his abilities lead him to. It's not what he's motivated to do. In the end, he ends up being elevated into that role, though, a role that he feels very uncomfortable in. Miradin. And I probably haven't pronounced that right, and my Welsh ancestors are probably spinning in their graves. He's the, uh, the, the, the Merlin character in the book, but very different to a uh, uh, Merlin that I, I think we've come across before. The book starts with him having dreams that, that, that he tries to explain. And these dreams are about the great danger in the land and the fact that the land needs a new sword wielder. And then he's led to find this boy wandering in the wild. And this boy wandering in the wild, lost, is uh, Arfnog. Miradin sort of is the manipulator. He, he wanders around the country trying to, trying to do the best for, for, the, for the Celtic people. He's a druid and he takes his role very, very seriously. He's a very brave man, uh, a very dangerous man, um, but a very intelligent, articulate man as well. Arfnog is given the task of taking a very insignificant looking little wooden cup back to Glastonbury. And on the way there, he meets um, the, the first person that, that he, he becomes very friendly, friendly with and, and, and team, teams up with. And this is a Pictish warrior woman called uh, Dunstane. Now, I, I took the idea from this, really, from, from the character Tristram. Uh, because Tristram comes from a, a Pictish name and the Pictish had female warriors. Um, Dunstane is uh, half Pictish, half Romano British. Uh, and on a, on, on a raid into Britain, she falls in love with um, a, a, a British woman who's been, who's been captured uh, and who should have been taken to her, her brother. She doesn't take this lady to her brother. Uh, they become lovers. The Pict kill Dunstane's Dunstane's partner, and she extracts vengeance on them. But she then travels to um, to to Glastonbury as well with the with, with the ashes of her her lover. That was one of her lover's wishes. And on the way there, she she meets Halfnog, um, and they realise they have a link, not a sort of a sexual attraction link, but but a bond be, be, between them. Again, she's, um, I saw her as quite a cold lady, extremely dangerous. 
but with a very nice side to her as well. So we come to, to, to one of my favourite characters really, uh, and that's Leothric. Uh, and Leothric are, are based around Lancelot, but again a very, very different type of uh, Lancelot. Leothric was uh, Saxon, uh, descended from Saxon chieftains, and he was brought up uh, by the Romans in the way that Romans used to take boys from tribes around their area and, and try to turn them into Romans. Well, Leofric didn't have a very good time with his own people. Um, and he was brought up within a Roman family. They accepted him into that family. He trained within the Roman army and he became the first Lance. That's where I first thought about sort of the, the Lancelot bit within that. But when he's fighting the um, the Germanic people as they're invading the, the Roman Empire in Northern Gaul, he becomes cursed. And he becomes cursed, really, that he, he has to kill in order to satisfy this insatiable hunger within him. So he goes into the Germanic lands and he fights uh, a lot of people. And he becomes a very acclaimed warrior. Um, one day he's caught in the wood. Um, between snowstorms and he can't make it to the next village to, to fight um, and he comes across a, a slave that's been brought across from Britain. He's almost like a vampire, he, he, he's desperate to kill but for some reason just before he makes the kill on this slave he, he looks into her face and she reminds him of the, the Roman lady that, that brought him up and he doesn't kill her. Uh, in that show of mercy, or after that day, his dreams that had become very troubled started to have a, a new figure appear in them, a figure of a water nymph. Fate leads him over to, uh, to, to Britain on Germanic raids in, in, into Britain. And he too ends up uh, meeting Arfnog. But I'm not going to go into too much detail around that really. Ambrosius Aurelius, the man who still controlled this this Roman that still controlled southwestern uh, southwestern Britain, he'd survived as 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 an imperial power even after all of uh, the, the, his his fellow sort of imperial officials uh, around him had collapsed one by one. In his youth, he fell in love with Ofnog's mother, and they had a relationship. But that relationship failed and um, she went off with Arfnog's father. Even so, he still never quite got over that. He's a very intelligent man, a very dangerous man, a very imperial. I, I, I imagined him with um, almost like all imperial characters get that sort of very upper class English accent, uh, even though he's Roman, uh, but 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 that's how how I imagined him there. His weakness is his arrogance, um, his self-importance. But fundamentally, there there is a seed of uh, of decency in him. Um, behind all the pomposity, there's probably quite a nice human being waiting to uh, waiting to come out. The old Welsh tales talk of Bran, uh, a great Welsh warrior who in the end is beheaded and has his head buried in, in London. And Bran turns up in, in my book too. And he's the exact opposite to Ambrosius Aurelius. He's what you'd imagine a Celtic chieftain to be like. He eats his meat from the bone, he talks what he feels, a very short, very powerful man but again he has a deep love for the the people uh, and he takes his role as chieftain of uh, South Wales very very seriously uh, I modelled him on the Salur and the Salur were um, probably the greatest fighters the Celts ever produced they took out a Roman legion in open battle a few centuries before uh, these were people you really didn't want to mess with um, 
Ambrosius Aurelius and Bran really don't get on. Mirrodin and Bran do get on. There's a, a, a lot of trust between the two between the two of them. I like Bran. Um, I have a lot of affection for, for a number of people from, from South Wales and Bran's sort of a, a, a mixture of them. Physically, I imagined him like a rugby forward, sort of a big neck, shortish man, very powerful. I'm going to do a shorter video soon with some of the other characters of Pride of Yen. But if you're interested, hit the uh, subscribe button at the bottom and you might even want to go to Amazon and have a look at the book itself, Pride of Yen Redemption by Robert Faulkner.